Okay, so hello and welcome to the Modern Witches YouTube channel. My name is Casey Zabala. Uh, she, her are my pronouns, and I am the sort of gatherer and creatrix of Modern Witches, still and always changing my title, my labels, because I think we're fluid people. So I'm excited to just be here and be this host of this interview series. And so grateful that Edgar Fabian Prias is here with us today uh, to have a conversation about magic. Thank you so much, Casey, for having me. It's such an honor to be connected to you and to this amazing community that you are bringing together. And um, just to share a little about, about myself, uh, my name is Edgar Fabian Frias, and I use they, them pronouns. And I'm a pretty multidimensional, multidisciplinary person. I identify as a brujekis or a witch. And I also am a licensed psychotherapist in the state of California. And I'm also so a visual artist and an educator and um, a creatrix as well. <laughs> so just, yeah, so, so grateful to have this conversation and to be able to um, invite people into this space as well. Awesome. Well, I'm so excited to just learn a little bit more about how you came to your magic and your witchcraft. Um, was there a moment in your life or sort of like a journey that unfolded for you to discover what magic meant for you or how you associated yourself with as a witch? Yeah, so I grew up pretty conservative in a Jehovah's Witness community. Uh, so for me, witchcraft was like something that was really evil. And, you know, um, I definitely had a lot of negative connotations growing up about it. And it wasn't really until I studied abroad that I met a lot of um, queer and trans people. I studied abroad in England. I did my art, um, my undergraduate art program, my last year in England. And, you know, I met a bunch of amazing queer and trans folks who were squatting and were living in these abandoned warehouses and homes and, they were also witches and they had like sex dungeons and were like eating from the trash at the stores and like we're living in a way that felt so radically different than what I knew growing up in Southern California. And, you know, just as I had heard that witches were evil, I also heard that queer and trans people were evil too. And so it was this moment where I started to really get curious and excited about the possibility of what magic and witchcraft could be. And I would say that, you know, I moved after that experience to Portland, Oregon, and I met a bunch of amazing queer and trans folks who were witches, are witches, and it was really with them that I finally started reading tarot and practicing um, spell casting and intention setting and I would say little by little I was brought in and, you know, I do have a, a very special moment that I remember I have a friend named um, Sarah who uh, she she's an amazing like academic at this point and she like met me at a time where I was like really drinking a lot and I we were like at a at a queer night one night and I like went outside to get a cigarette and, and she like saw me um and she just like looked at me and she's like I know why you drink so much and I was like what do you mean she's like well, I can just sense that you have a lot of voices that speak to you. And I know how overwhelming that could be. And we ended up having an amazing long conversation. And it was one of those moments that like a witch sees another witch, you know, and really helps them see themselves, you know. And I think um, that's what's so important about witches being public or connecting with other people is that like, we sometimes can't see ourselves unless you have someone reflect it back to you. That's so potent. It, it reminds me of a moment and I was at an herbal conference and this witch came up to me and was just like, I see you and whispered to my ear and walked away, oh like never gosh. to be seen again. <laughs> but it's those moments, right? It's like, it is this, this mirror work um, that I think witches are super tuned into. Um, because we see through the veils in even mundane situations when we're smoking cigarettes, right? It's like mm -hmm. ever present. Um, and I'm curious because I know you you taught um, 
I think it was, a, sorry, linear time is hard for me, but I think it was 2020 <laughs> at the Witches Confluence when you taught uh, the yes. workshop on Obsidian. Yeah. And scrying. So is mirror work a part, a big part of your practice or is it central oh, to yeah. who you are? Yeah, well, I think, you know, one, I'm a Gemini. So <laughs> like that mirror magic is definitely a part of my being. Um, and yes, I've used mirrors, you know, with obsidian, with water. I, you know, I work with scrying a lot in my own personal um, practice and it's really been so transformative. That's why I love teaching about it because I've received so many messages about art making, about my life, about my ancestors, about people in my community and I just know how powerful it is to spend time with that mirror and knowing that that mirror can be so many things right it can be you know like you said earlier that witch coming up to you and whispering into your ear that's a moment of a mirror right and also being able to spend time with a tree is another moment of having a mirror reflecting back to you and yeah, I think, you know, one thing that's coming up as we're talking about this is how we're in the lovers, you know, year, and that's very much also mirror magic, and, you know, love is this powerful portal that allows us to really um, go beyond ourselves and dream and imagine beyond ourselves and also be um, responsible beyond ourselves and be connected to something much larger than us. And those are all things that I really do feel are so necessary for our um, sense of self, our development, and also our sense of connection that is like so, I know, and I know, I think for me, one of the things that I felt growing up as like an you know, visionary person was that I was so alone. And I think that's why it was so important to have those witches see me you know I think that's why it's important that we find each other and that we connect and hold on to each other you know I fully agree with that yeah I think um yeah it's like this this sense of feeling othered because you you see things that other people don't see um and when you try to I remember like trying to talk to people about you know witchy or magical or supernatural things that I was experiencing and sort of getting this like, <laughs> what are you talking about? You know, um, reaction that doesn't make you feel supported. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, you know, meeting, meeting your, your witch and queer peers in England seem to have such a big effect on you. Um, and, and also how have you sort of worked to connect with your ancestors and your lineage? Because it does seem like you're your work is also very much rooted in that. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, so when I think about ancestors, I definitely see those queer and trans people as ancestors, right? And I also know that I'm a part of a, a lineage that has like a land and has a community. And, you know, many of those people have been displaced and dislocated from that land. Um, my family's from Mexico, from Zacatecas and Jalisco. And um, there are multiple indigenous communities that are there, but I'm specifically from an indigenous community called the Viraritari people or the Virarica. And um, it wasn't something that I grew up with, you know, just in the same way that I didn't grow up around witches. Like I also grew up thinking that indigenous culture and indigenous beliefs were pagan and, and, and wrong too. And a lot of that has to do with, you know, colonization. And it wasn't until my 30s that I like finally um, had my father share with me about our indigenous ancestry. And of course it came through one of those mirror moments, which was a dream. I, I was visited by my ancestors in a dream and they told me to go look for them. And I found them in a rock. It was in a beautiful crystal that I found on a hike with my partner. And that was kind of the portal that I needed to finally have a space to share it with my father and for him to open up and be like, oh, wow, what you're doing, you know, at maybe for a while he thought it was weird that I was into it. But I feel like that was the moment where he really said like, what you're doing is what your grandfather used to do. What you're doing is what our people did before we moved into the village that we grew up in because that these are practices that are much older than us. And 
I think that was one of those like record skipping moments in my life where, you know, growing up Christian and conservative, I had, I had only really associated witchcraft with, um, you know, the evil queer and trans communities that I was a part of. And to hear that it was also a part of another lineage, you know, that goes back in time, you know, both, you know, the queer and trans and the indigenous lineages are ancient. And I think that was one of those kind of spaces where I really realized that I've had ancestors speaking to me my whole life um, mm. and they've been guiding me my whole life and really opened up this possibility and so yeah and that's actually what got me into obsidian work and actually what got me into really um, connecting with scrying because I wanted to speak with them more you know especially being separated from them for so long and They've definitely given me many visions for projects and ceremonies that I've been able to create. And I think that's that's one of the powerful things about connecting with your ancestors is that many of them have been trying to already. They've been trying to reach out to you because a lot of them have like desires and wishes and suggestions for you as a person because you are an ex you are them too. And so I think that that. Yeah, that was one of those big moments that I still feel like I'm processing and I still feel like I'm living through. Yeah, that's so, it's so beautiful that the, the a crystal or a, a stone was a portal for you. It feels so, um, I mean, it's such an ancient object, an object of the earth, like the earth bones is how I sometimes think about crystals or stones. Um, and I think we forget that the earth can be that portal for us to our lineage or to our ancestors. Um, and that, you know, in ancient worlds, those things weren't as separate as they are seemingly now. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, can you define, um, or I know you, you, you have your own ways of acknowledging yourself as a witch, but I would love for you to like explain that a little bit more, like your witch label or your witch uh, definition for us. Um, label is <laughs> not a great word, but. Yeah. Do you mind sharing a little bit what you mean by that? Just so I kind of understand, like, like kind of yeah. like what my witch essence is or like, yeah, I'm yeah, not, not sure I if guess. I really, yeah. I think, I think, I guess what I'm trying to get at is you know, some people are hedge witches, some people mm. are brujas, some people are medicine people. Um, and I think for some people, those um, ways of describing their witchcraft are very important because they carry with them some kind of cultural significance or lineage. Um, and for some of us, we don't know what that is or it's shifting right. all the time. So I'm wondering how you feel as a witch today or in this current <laughs> phase of your magic? So I definitely call myself a mutant. That's like kind of one thing that I feel encompasses because it is very slippery as a concept. Um, and it's always growing and changing and um, kind of similar to what you said about yourself earlier, I'm definitely always transforming and growing. And um, also, you know, as I've mentioned, being a Gemini, I find it really hard to get fixed somewhere. I'm so mutable and I want to flow and grow. Um, and at the same time, I definitely know that I'm connected to some deep practices that are about healing and are about having visionary capacities. Like, I don't take it lightly that I've been gifted um, psychic gifts and that I've been gifted the ability to really um, tune into energies and people and animals and crystals. Those are sacred gifts that come with um, a, long, a long legacy and a long responsibility. And so I definitely um, know those are part of my witch identity. And at the same time, I definitely have a big part of myself that resists um, any boxing or any, um, yeah, stagnation around what it means to be alive, what it means to be creating, what it means to be connecting and knowing that my purpose is shifting. And I think that is a part of my mutant witchcraft is that, I know that my ancestors have brought me here to this plane for specific purposes that are really seeking that 
level of fluidity, that level of adaptation. And I think we are living in such transformative times that are constantly asking us for that level of transformation. And so I definitely have hung on to the concept of mutant because it feels so emergent. And I also place so much hope in the concept of mutant too, as there being something that is um, conscious and growing and responsive and interdependent. Beautiful. And how would you define your magic or magic broadly? Hmm. There's definitely something there about connection and about being able to make connections both with people, but also make connections across time and space, make connections uh, beyond what's in the physical realm. I've seen that as a therapist, also as a healer, as an interdisciplinary person who works within multiple academic realms and who also works within different um, vocational realms. Uh, there is something about being an interlocutor, being an intermediary, and also weaving connection that definitely feels like a big part of my magic that I really have gotten the message from my ancestors that there are people who have been brought to this plane to really heal a lot of that division and dislocation that capitalism and colonization have created. And I think that's why so many witches are being called to really traverse between dimensions and traverse between vocations. And how um, I remember when I first, um, I struggled a lot when I first decided to identify as a witch and decided to really move in this direction. Because for all my life, I've been told that I needed one path and I needed one one, one vocation or one career. And I really feel like there was a long time that I believed that there was a long time that I really feel, struggled to feel so multi multiplist and, and, and multidimensional. And now I don't feel that way. And I feel like so many people are liberated in that way too, that so many people are not really feeling bound to that idea. And we're creating something else, you know, we're creating another dimension where we get to really live out our passions and our desires and experiment and fail and grow in ways that we're being asked to grow instead of kind of moving along the path that this um, system has really laid in place for us that hasn't really been um, providing us with what we've needed. And I think that's why so many people are being excited by what it means to be um, a witch and also what it means to free yourself, you know, and, and grow in ways that, you know, are maybe scary and outside of the norm, but are also really activating and exhilarating. And many of us are getting the messages to move in these paths. Mm, I absolutely feel that. And I feel like you really beautifully spoke to sort of a question I was going to ask you, which is, what does it mean to practice magic in, a, in this modern world? Mm. Um, and it's, it feels like to me, it's very inherently um, healing this capitalist patriarchal system that's been in place. The magic can, can be a really important tool for all of us in healing the harm that's been done. Definitely, yeah. And that that magic can show up in so many different ways. And, you know, I am really honored by the work of Legacy Russell, who's created this amazing book called Glitch Feminism. And she talks a lot about the artificial divide between the digital and the physical that's been created by like society and how many witches are really working with the digital as a way to spread their messages, spread their spells, to set intentions, to work with groups and I think that that has been so inspiring because especially with the pandemic shifting so much of what we've done, you know, um, I, for a long time, I was so used to connecting with people in the physical space and really seeing magic as existing in that physical space. And, 
you know, more and more because we've needed to pivot. Like I'm really been uh, so, so enamored by the innovations, the creations that witches are making in the digital realm and how much I'm actually seeing them transforming culture and transforming connection and conversation. And also, you know, showing up all over the place in the quote unquote physical dimension too. And I think that's something that is really, um, yeah, and, and I think I'm someone who, again, being a bridge, being an intermediary, like I definitely connect a lot with ancient, you know, technologies, you know, divination is very ancient, and uh, so is, um, you know, work clouds, connecting with animals, you know, like you said, the bones of the earth, like all of those are elements and energies that are so sacred and that I connect with and, and also definitely love bringing them into this space, into the digital realm, into the um, etheric connection of the internet, you know, because I think that that's, yeah, that's how, you know, we are growing together now. And I think, you know, uh, it maybe has us some time to really understand that life is continuing on. I feel like for a while I felt personally like, oh, this digital space is just like an intermediary space before we get back together and like really just seeing like how many of us are having our like our growth and our breakdowns and our like connections in these digital spaces and how real they really are too. And so I'm so excited by artists and creatives and uh, witches who are using this space to really um, to galvanize something that is so collective and so emergent. And I think that's also what feels so exciting about this too, is that a lot of people like from around the world are getting called to move in this direction. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's so interesting to see and to feel into the alchemy of the ancient and the digital and the collapsing of timelines and how important that could be for for like this very linear sense of time that we're all sort of like being beholden to mm. in capitalism um it's very exciting and i think you're someone who i i see and i witness on the digital spaces and all your digital spells and they all feel so authentic and like really rooted in your magic in a really uh empowering way and I think there's there's interesting energies also at play in this digital space that are trying to corral us or make us perform a certain way. Um, so I'm I'm just I'm personally very excited to see like witches creating their own social media platforms, magic happening <laughs> in the digital spaces that creates more freedom and liberation. I know, and I think we're in a very interesting moment right now. Um, Kiki, who is also known as Opulent Witch online, um, they had something really interesting to say about the internet, that the internet is in its Saturn return. And there's definitely a way that the internet is having some growth pains you know, that we're seeing. Um, and there's so much transformation happening on the internet um, and also just with technology in general. And I really do um, get a sense, especially because I'm living in a witch bubble. Um, I get a sense that witches are leading the way. They're creating, you know, as you're naming, like different ways of connecting and they're really influencing those people that are creating the, the, the groundwork. And, you know, I think that's something that I've been thinking a lot about because a lot of my spells I've released on social media, a lot of my spells I've like released on platforms that maybe I don't know how I feel about them anymore, you know, and, and our relationships to these platforms are changing. And yeah, and I, I definitely been getting the message to become more of an internet slut, you know, and really move into different dimensions, you know, because I've been so beholden to like Instagram, for example, and have been really getting the message that we're, um, we're really being asked to go and collect and connect with people all over the world and that not everyone is using these platforms. And so um, definitely been exciting to see other witches moving into other um, spaces and also as you named creating spaces too. Totally. I'm very excited about the potential there. We've been talking a lot about the digital spaces in witchcraft, but I am curious 
um, because I'm also someone who's currently in academia, like how is your experience of bringing your witchcraft and your magic into the academic space? How has that been for you? Very good question. <laughs> yeah, it's been interesting. I would say it's been mixed and um, I'm so grateful for people like Eliza Swan and other friends of mine who have built spaces outside of academia and also spaces that I feel like have been meant to help people process the trauma of academia. Um, I'm so grateful for having that before I like stepped back into academia. Um, this is my second master's. And so I very much am well aware of the inherent biases of academia, the inherent hierarchies around knowledge and certain forms of knowledge. And so I think that's helped me be prepared. And I also walk into academia really feeling like I'm I am a part of a huge network of witches who are all validating and usurping these hierarchies. So that has been so helpful. <laughs> you know, that has been such a blessing. And I have found many other witches in the academic space. And I've also, of course, been finding a lot of non-believers too, you know, <laughs> and people who maybe see it with curiosity or with fear and I've had to learn, you know, how to how to navigate that and how to communicate. And also, I think one thing that I've been really learning too is that, you know, really thinking of the context of what you're making, you know, and I've noticed that like the work I've made within the academic space has really shifted because, you know, I don't necessarily know if they deserve work that's sacred you know <laughs> like um or maybe sacredness can change what it means in those spaces you know and you know right now I'm working on my thesis show and it for me is a big piece of like self-healing that I'm working on and really letting myself have a space to explore and imagine like I'm working on a piece that is really centered around indigenous futurism and really allowing myself to imagine another world into existence. And um, so far, I feel like the, the people in, in the academy are really excited about it and they have been really supportive. Um, but I also know that um, there's a tension there. And I think that that tension is really interesting and exciting too. And um, I'm just so grateful for witches, you know, you included, who are like creating their own spaces, their own spaces of, you know, intergenerational exchange and knowledge sharing. And I think that it to me is so needed because I know so many people are alienated or really get hurt by these academic spaces too. Absolutely. Yeah, there's, there's definitely plenty of harm in academia. Um, but I think it's interesting to kind of go into those spaces with knowing what is sacred to you and then sort of like pushing that a little bit and seeing how you can, like what feels comfortable enough, what sacred piece of you feels comfortable enough to bring to the work and what doesn't. Um, but it is, it, go for it. No, and I want to say something about that too that I think is yeah. important for anyone listening is that, you know, when you get into graduate school, the the whole education is really for you. I think we're really as undergrads or even before that, like we're really taught that like we're supposed to be learning something from someone, right? And I've really gotten the sense, and this is something that I've had to advocate many times for, but that really when you're in graduate school, it's really for you. And so if I've actually had the experience when I got my master's in counseling, for example, in my last class, we had um, our professor really wanted us to go down into the cognitive behavioral model and to really only look at people through a lens of cognitive behavioral therapy. And I, at that time, had already gotten to a point where I was like, I, you know, respect that, but I don't want to go down that path and had to advocate for myself to really um, explore the realms of somatic psychotherapy and mindfulness and psychic phenomena in therapy. And so I think that, you know, there is so much information in like, you know, let's say whatever field you're in, if you want to study something witchy, esoteric, you know, mystical, 
part connected to wisdom traditions. There's so much there and you should be allowed to go in that direction. And if your professors are not letting you, like that's like something that needs to be addressed, you know? And I think that there are ways to push up against certain hierarchies that professors can have. And I just want to say that just because it's something I didn't really know. And it's just something that I've found, you know, through my experience. I don't know what your experience has been like, Casey, in academia, but like that's something I I want people to know. Yes, I definitely echo that. I think I return to academia having like a really, really hard relationship with education. Um, but I knew that I wanted to do research and that's why I wanted to go to graduate school um, and really like hone my writing. And when I got there, I realized, oh, I'm actually gonna have to like fight for myself more than I expected to. Um, and I was kind of used to fighting for myself, but I didn't realize <laughs> I was like putting myself back in the in that situation. Right. <laughs> um, but it's true. I think graduate school is for you and it's really about accessing the resources and giving yourself this really immense gift of space and dedication and devotion to doing that work. Um, so yes, advocate for yourself. And I do, I do think there's so much in the field of spirituality, witchcraft, magic, indigenous studies, um, that is really ready to have a voice. Um, and there's so many ways that people can be thinking about this stuff and writing about it. And I just, I personally want to see more. Um, so I hope more witches get into it and uh, sort of storm the halls of academia. Yes. Yeah. I, <laughs> I love that. that vision. I'm like imagining them all. <laughs> right. <laughs> Carrying brooms and crystals and flowers. <laughs> yes. Sweeping the dusty, dusty halls. I love it. <laughs> and using those resources. I love that you said that. Yes, go use those resources because a lot of these academic spaces are hoarding knowledge and have archives that are so important to, you know, witch history and to indigenous history. And I think that um, that's been one of the big kind of learning lessons for me is that like, I can really connect more with my ancestors using their resources, learning more because they do hold all this, all this information. And so, which is, you know, go connect with that. <laughs> yeah. And it's all, I mean, in my experience, it's a lot of misinterpreted information because right. the queer people, the trans people, the magical beings and the indigenous people haven't been able to share their perspective and their voice. So yes. um, there is a lot of rewriting to be done. Yes, definitely, hundred um, percent. Yeah, research is magic too, I think. <laughs> yeah, writing essays is magic, you know, intervening in, in those long historical traditions of, you know, obfuscation and negation, as you said, is magic. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, and re-envisioning and re-imagining is magic too. I think that's, I've been really leaning into that. Um, I think that's why I really am in, inspired by the, the Afrofuturist and Indigenous Futurist movement, because it really is about reimagining something from all that like negation and all that like loss too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, this, this conversation is leading me to kind of ask you maybe a hard question, but what is your greatest hope for the future as, as a person just living in this human condition? Oh, yeah. I am so hopeful that, you know, I think I'm definitely someone that believes that illness visits us with a message and that when illness comes, I'm someone who had many, has had many illnesses and I definitely feel like there's a lot to be gained from listening to what the illness is wanting. And I feel like collectively, there are many messages that the illnesses, the collective illnesses that we're forced to participate in are telling us. And so 
it really is my hope that we bring more folks who are disabled, who are queer and trans, who are visionaries into the center of community to really help us hear those messages that you know many of us have had to um, integrate and to understand through our positionalities and to really let that be what guides our future. And I know that there has been such a deep rupture that's happened historically where you know witches and healers and visionaries have always been at the center of community you know for thousands and thousands of years and we've always guided we've always been there to reflect back you know going back to the mirror and we are mirrors of the earth and that's why so many of us as witches are also being called to go into the cultural realms because we know the power of culture we know the power of communication and so i'm really really, really seeing that as a way of us reorganizing our society is really centering these people and voices and experiences that are so necessary and turning away from these toxic, violent, hierarchical, you know, um, war hungry voices that have been, you know, quote unquote, guiding and leading our communities. And that is my hope for the future is that the witches can really be brought back into the center and then from there you know us having spirit in the center things can become realigned and reorganized and yeah I think that that's my biggest hope and I think that's also why a lot of us are really um dedicating our lives to this right absolutely that's very much my hope as well may it be so I also just got like, really beautiful visions of um, the dark crystal, like that. I don't know if you're familiar with that movie, but um, yes. that was kind of like pulsing through my my visions as you were talking in like this really <laughs> cool way. So I don't know what that means, but dark crystal energy. Yeah. Take back our power <laughs> and honor the earth. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Uh. I love that. Yeah, that's like time travel magic. I can see mm -hmm. feel my younger self. <laughs> yes. And I think that's like, yeah, that that beauty and magic of culture, right? That like so many of us, I think of the dark crystal, I think of like Fern Gully, like um Captain Planet and the Planeteers, like all these like things that really were like inscribed in my being as a young person that have really influenced how I feel about the earth and about community and connection now. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm excited uh, for more people to experience your art because you're also contributing such beautiful work to that vision. So thank you for all, all that you're creating. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, it is an honor to be a part of that lineage of witches and visionaries who are creating. I think that, <clears throat> yeah, this, you know, this last year being being brought into the Tashin witchcraft book was such a huge moment for me as an artist to have my work brought into a community of people that I really res yeah, admire and respect. And yeah, and really seeing how witches are at the forefront. You know, so many artists are visionaries and a lot of artists work doesn't get understood until years later. And I think that's also, you know, that beautiful like intersection that I, you know, I've na been naming as like my magic is that like, I'm really seeing that deep connection between witchcraft and art making. And it, I think it doesn't make any sense that a lot of MFA programs don't talk about witchcraft. <laughs> I'm like, what are we doing? Not, not like talking about ceremony or what it means to be an oracle. Absolutely. Yeah. It's such a, art making is, is completely oracular in my opinion. Yeah. Well, I'm curious if you have, since we're kind of in this interesting transformative time, if you could share sort of some advice or like an embodiment practice that you think would be supportive to witches who are either feeling like they need some love and support on their path or just seeking some kind of affirmation. Hmm. I think one thing that's been really powerful for me during this time is honoring the void, 
honoring the unknown, honoring what it feels like to not be sure about what your future looks like. I think it's been really scary. And I think we are in scary times where so much change has happened so quickly, so much has been feeling unstable and so many things that we believed in or thought we knew have been brought into question. And I've been really honoring, honoring that instability, honoring that uncertainty. And so I've been really building a practice of connecting with that sacred, the potential, the, the pregnant potential of the sacred void. And you know, I've been practicing different things. I think definitely divination and scrying is one of the ways that I honor the sacred void. And also I would say allowing myself to do things that feel pointless, allowing myself to do things that don't feel like they have a purpose. Um, of course, many times only to come to understand their purpose later, you know, and <laughs> I think that's a way of really getting outside of the the level of consciousness that capitalism really wants us to be in, that we're always so goal oriented and driven towards stuff. And uh, so, you know, some ways I do this is like, I go on walks and like, don't have a plan and just like, you know, kind of allow the animals to guide me or the wind, you know, and, and I think there are many, you know, that's just one way. And I think, you know, movement has been so, so important and like physical embodiment has been so important because this pandemic has like really brought us into the digital realm, which can many times means that our bodies are really inactive, right? Or our bodies can be like in the astral, but they're in the physical dimension, not really traveling very much. So I, it's been really healing and transformative for me to have like physical embodied practices in whatever way that makes sense for you. So really finding ways to move your body and to also connect with things that are outside of the, the screen-based world, I think have without again you know without having a, a a clear sense why or how or what you're doing I think those are gifts to just dedicate that for yourself and so I you know usually will give myself let's say like an hour that's like I think the only thing I do is like I will structure like a time limit maybe <laughs> especially because if I have other things I have to do but I'll give myself some time, but then in that time, then you have your free, your free play, basically, and you get to just like be guided or led. Um, and I think it's so important. There's so much that emerges from that space. That's great advice. And I think, you know, this year, I feel like everyone's sort of realizing, okay, it's time to like, listen to my body and, you know, take a step back sometimes or slow down as much as possible, because um, I think one of the silver linings maybe of this time is that we're realizing how much of like our sense of time is so constructed by capitalism, by all these forces that aren't necessarily supporting us. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And that our body has needs, right? And, and, and has desires and I've definitely noticed the older I've gotten, if I don't move my body, it will tell me, you know, it will let me know. And I think that's something that I've also been, you know, with people um, transitioning and there being a lot of illness, it's really also made me think a lot about health and how important it is to care for yourself and care for your loved ones and really, um, yeah, think about health maybe in ways that I had not really thought about before and how that's really also connected to your magic too and to your ability to, to continue doing this work, you know, because we, a lot of us are called to do this sacred work. And so we want our vessels to really be ready for that, you know, and I know that that looks different for different people, but I think that's something I've been also really learning is to listen to what my body is saying and, you know, to turn away as you're naming from the constructs that want to control our attention and to really take that time to listen to what your body is telling you in the moment. Beautiful. Yes. Well, this has been such a pleasure. This conversation, I feel like I could talk to you for much longer. <laughs> um, but I really appreciate your time. And I would love it if you could share how folks could continue to 
support you, learn from you, see your artwork. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So I have a website, edgarfabianfrias.org. And I also have a link tree, which is my name at Edgar Fabian Frias. Um, and that has all the links. And you could also find all those links on my website too. And I have a newsletter. And in my newsletter, I announce like public events that I'm doing, lectures or, you know, artist talks, or I also announce um, my openings for tarot sessions. And I also, every once in a while, hold um, openings for consultations consultations. Um, I definitely meet with folks who have questions around their career or around their spiritual path. And so if you want to meet with me, that's um, the way you do that is by getting on my mailing list and um, signing up when I send out those openings because they usually go pretty quickly. So um, yeah, I definitely also um, offer two card readings on Hey Hero. Um, I kind of, because I've gotten so many messages from people who want tarot readings and I just like physically cannot do all of them, I've and I've started opening up that option for folks if they want a two card mini reading, they can connect with me in that way too. And that's all found um, on, through my link tree as well. Amazing. And we'll be sure to link all that and share it in our show notes. Um, thank you so much. I can't wait to continue the conversation. Yeah. Thank you so much, Casey. Such a gift to connect with you. And yeah, looking forward to future conversations and collaborations. Yes. I cannot wait.